Hi, everybody, and welcome. I'm Delia Clark, and I am a place-based education consultant working with the Iditarod Historic Trail Alliance in partnership with the Chugach National Forest, BLM Campbell Creek Science Center, and the Anchorage Park Foundation. In normal years, we offer the Iditarod Trail to Every Classroom program, which we call iTrek, as an 11-day in-person teacher professional learning program spread across a year. <laughs> iTrek encourages teachers to think about how they can connect to place, how to bring their students outside more, how to bring outside resources into the classroom, and how they can connect with the Iditarod Trail and the cultural and natural landscapes of Alaska. During the pandemic, we're offering some of the core elements of iTrek in this webinar series called Take It Outside to continue to serve Alaskan educators in ways that we hope are valuable to you. We hope you can use the information that you get today to encourage your students to get outside and learn more about the nature and culture of Alaska. We'll be offering this series throughout the rest of the school year, and we hope you're able to attend more sessions. If you're interested in receiving one UAA credit for participating, we're just past the registration deadline, but you might be able to squeak in. So I would uh, suggest letting us know if you're interested in trying that by contacting us at itrekalaska at gmail.com, I-T-R-E-C-A-L-A-S-K-A at gmail.com. And also, if you contact us there, we could send you a, a nice, pretty flyer that uh, lists all the different events in the, in the series. And now I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Marshall Welsh, who's going to be talking about reflection and the power of reflection in place-based learning. Marshall's been a well-appreciated presenter in the iTrek program for over 10 years, and he was a regular feature in the Appalachian Trail to Every Classroom before that. He retired from St. Mary's College in California, and he now lives and writes in Oregon. Over to you, Marshall. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. And I'm going to share my screen here <clears throat> and hope it pops up. There it is. OK. And you can hear me OK? All right. Well, I'm really glad to be here. Um, I've always enjoyed working with this group. I love working with teachers. Teachers are heroes uh, in, in my book, and even more so now in these crazy, these crazy times and crazy days. Um, <clears throat> And so thank you for doing what you do. Um, I really take pride in providing information that you can use. I'm hoping that some of the things you'll see today, you can use tomorrow in your classroom. And, um, and this has traditionally been a half day workshop that we're doing in 90 minutes on Zoom. So um, this will be an interesting process, but I invite you to come in. Yes. Marshall, if you switch to presenter mode, then we'll only see the big uh, slide and not all the little slides. Right, behind. and I haven't, I just haven't gotten there yet. Ah, there, okay. we okay. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. No worries. All right, well, let's just jump right in. Uh, like uh, the introduction said, I've been doing this in higher ed for 30 years. I was in teacher education. I was an administrator for service learning uh, programs. And I've done a lot of international and national workshops, presentations. Rita Hennessy, uh, who was on the Appalachian Trail, uh, participated in this workshop, well, more than 10 years ago. And um, Annette invited me to work with the Iditarod group and so I've been up to Alaska and to Seward and Anchorage a number of times and just love my time up there. Uh, and I've always enjoyed seeing and learning about everybody's projects along the trail. There was one ex really exciting project uh, in Seward with elementary kids doing water sampling. That I mean, they were, they were doing science, but they were good citizens and reporting to the city about water contamination. And I mean, it was just such an exciting thing to see happen, these kids being uh, civic scientists in the classroom and out in the community. So I, that I've just really enjoyed doing this. We're gonna start with a quick overview of some terms and principles, just to make sure that we are on the same page and then jump into practical applications, looking at goals for reflection, formats, techniques, and how to assess it. 
So preface here, <clears throat> the information I'm presenting here today cuts across multiple ages and grades. You're gonna have to adapt it to your situation and needs, but what I'm showing you will work with kindergartners all the way to college students, but you're the expert, you know what your kids needs, you know the context, the demographics, so you'll have to adapt it in terms of complexity or vocabulary, but the basic steps and principles can be used all the way across. All right, to start, I am inviting you to write down your definition of reflection. Take a piece of paper, an index card, any, anything that you've got handy, and I want you to simply write down um, your definition of what reflection means to you. And so we're going to have a little silence here. Um, I guess I could sing the Jeopardy tune here. But right now, take a piece of paper, quick brain dump, don't think about it too hard, 60 seconds or less, your definition of reflection. Do it now. few more seconds. <clears throat> How are we doing? Okay, get that last lick in. Hold on to this definition. Don't throw it away. We're going to use it in just a few minutes. All right. Okay. That's a little mental aerobics there to get us going here. All right. Now, what I want you to do, if you're with a group of people or you're by yourself, look at what you've written. And, and, and I'm sure you're coming up with all kinds of different things about a reflection of um, seeking meaning and um, personal growth, um, all kinds of different things. Um, review, contemplation, um, assessment, different things that is in your definition. Um, mining experiences, that's one that's come up, right? Well, what we've just done here is an actual reflection strategy. It's called preflection, and we're going to unpack this later on, so stay tuned, okay? You've already started doing reflection right here and now. How's it feel so far? Okay, good. I like to think of reflection in service learning as tending a garden. If you throw a seed in the ground, cover it with dirt and walk away and hope something grows, you're probably gonna be disappointed. Um, if you're really gonna have a garden and want something to grow, you need to tend to it. You need to water it. You need to put fertilizer on it. You need to pull the weeds. You need to make sure it's getting a lot of sunlight all these things. The same thing is true with community-based service learning. You can't just plant a student out in a community setting and expect them to grow and learn. You have to tend to it. And reflection is that process. To tend to it, pull the weeds, throw a little manure on there, um, because sometimes the stinky stuff helps us grow when we have to encounter that stuff. So reflection is an integral part of service learning, just like tending a garden. Let's make sure we're on the same page. What do we mean when we say service learning? And the National Youth Leadership Council defines service learning as an educational method that combines elements of experiential education with community service. It involves youths as resources to their schools and community as they apply academic skills to community needs and opportunities with the support of adult partners. It's not volunteering, and it's no more optional or voluntary than any other learning assignment you have in your classroom. It's just like a test. It's just like a written paper. It's just like a reading assignment. It is not volunteering. It is a pedagogical exercise. <clears throat> Throughout the process, reflection is the key to growth and understanding. 
Young people use critical and, criti and creative thinking to ensure that the learning makes sense and has meaning for their growth and experience. Therefore, this is the important part for our time today. Reflection activity should be used before, during, and after the service experience to assess where students are in the learning process and to help them internalize the learning, provide opportunities for them to voice concerns and share feelings and evaluate the project. So this isn't just a touchy-feely group hug. This is an academic exercise and process that we use before, during, and after. Now, I know a lot of times when people are doing service learning, they know in the back of their minds that reflection is really important, and they've gone a few weeks, and they go, oh, yeah, well, we should probably do some reflection now. So class, let's reflect. And you get crickets. They, they don't know what to do or say because they don't know what that means, all right? Reflection is a is a art, it's a science, and hopefully today I'll give you some tools that you can use with your kids tomorrow. If we triangulate service learning, <clears throat> for teachers, maybe the most important part is the study, the academic side of it, and that's what's happening up here in the head. And then the service is the action, it's the hands, it's the doing, it's the, the application, the hands-on stuff. Reflection is where we consider what we're learning and doing, and, and it's here. It's the wisdom. Head is knowledge, okay? Reflection is wisdom, making meaning of that knowledge and what it is that we've been studying and doing. Here's an easy way to completely operationalize place-based service learning using a first letter mnemonic device called OPERA. OPERA is a big production, and so is place-based service learning. So first, we have objectives. And actually, that's objective squared, because you have learning and academic objectives, and your community partner has objectives and goals as well. And that's the second piece to the OPERA mnemonic device, is partnerships. Your community partner are co-educators. They are civic scholars and experts in their field out in the real world. And you work together to have your students engaged in physical, active learning in an authentic place, doing things that tie into what you're doing in the classroom and what your community partner is doing out in the community. And along the way, you stop and reflect. You reflect before you get into the community, you reflect once you're in the community, and you reflect afterwards. Ultimately, when all of this is done, we want to conduct some assessment. But that brings us right back to where we started to objectives. Did we, in fact, meet the objectives of the classroom, the academic um, educational objectives, and the objectives and goals of the community partner? And so that circular process really is a nice way of thinking about what service learning is and how to make it work. Here's an example. This is, this is actually uh, comes from an Alaska uh, classroom from about 10 years ago. It was a sixth grade class doing trail maintenance. And the objectives was to integrate the scientific method with math and environmental studies while developing and improving the trails around the school in the city. The partners were the Bureau of Land Management, the City Parks, and the Iditarod Alliance. The students were engaged by conducting research and implementing best practice for trail maintenance to reduce rain off and mud management. The reflection technique they used was called what, so what, now what, Stay tuned, you're gonna learn what that is here. And the assessment was a pre-post evaluation of the actual condition of the trails, the partner satisfaction with the work, and a final exam. So there's an example of how we operationalized service learning using the OPERA first letter mnemonic device. So what is reflection in service learning? 
Reflection can be a lot of different things in a lot of different contexts. It can be very spiritual. It can be very personal. But in the context of service learning, I love the succinct definition by Julie Hatcher and Bob Bringle. It is the intentional consideration of an experience in light of particular learning objectives. Notice some words are underlined. Intentional consideration. So you're not just kind of making it up and say, oh, what do you think, kids? And it's tied to what we're supposed to be learning. So a few minutes ago, I invited you to write your definition of reflection. And now I want you to hold your definition up, compare what you wrote to what's right here on the screen. What does your definition say, include or not include? Does it look like this definition of the intentional consideration of experience in light of particular learning objectives? Here's my guess. A lot of folks forget about the learning objectives and sometimes we don't think of it as an intentional act or activity. It's very important that your concept and understanding and definition of reflection includes intentional consideration of an experience in light of uh, particular learning objectives. Let me ask you a question before we go any farther. Is there a difference between a report and, a re and reflection? And here's why I ask you that question. Many teachers that I talk to in K-12 settings or in higher education settings, when I say, ask them, are you doing service learning? And they say, yes. And, um, um, and I ask them if they um, do reflection, they'll say, oh yes, the students write a report. Well, here's the thing. Report and reflection are related and there's some crossover, but they're not quite the same thing. So as we think about the difference between a report and reflection, we realize the primary audience of a report is external. It's a teacher, it's an agency. Whereas reflection, the primary audience is internal. It's an internal process of the student and the secondary audience is the teacher and maybe the community partner. So I wanna make sure we understand that we're not just writing a report of what we did out in the community. We're really internalizing and making meaning of what happened. And um, it gives the students to truly uh, bring it home and understand why they're doing what they're doing and what difference it makes. Now, a lot of times people will confuse reflection or critical reflection with what I call warbling. And warbling is when students give you dear diary entries. And I will be honest with you here and confess right now, my first reflection activities with my students was terrible. And the reason was they didn't know how to do reflection. I didn't know how to do reflection and I didn't know how to teach them. And so when I asked them to write in their journals, I got dear diary entries. Today, we tutored the kids at the uh, homeless shelter and it was really cool two weeks later. Today, we tutored the kids in the, read in the shelter and it's still really cool. And I just got dear diary entries. I know what you're doing, okay? Sometimes I get warm fuzzies and sometimes they are really sincere and authentic and moving. And sometimes it was just something they thought the teacher wanted. Dear Dr. Welch, I'll never be the same after this experience. I'm so blessed. And they're giving me all this stuff they think I want them to give me. All right. Sometimes they'll, I'll read or hear in a reflection activity something along these lines. You know, I'm so glad I got to help those people. They seem so happy. And when we hear kind of stereotypical uh, statements tied to privilege and power, 
that's a red flag. And that's what that red flag is there. And that is something that you as a teacher want to reflect on with your students. So critical reflection is not warbling. It's not warm fuzzies and it's not dear diary entries. It's really asking, so what? Why does this make a difference? Does it make a difference? Now, what do we do? It's the constructive and critical examination of self, society, and the experience itself. And we have to recognize the complexities of issues and our actions. And even, you know, first and second graders can do this. So, Reflection in service learning can go beyond our technical definition to include things like assessing student growth that we'll see here in a minute. In that way, teaching uh, reflection actually becomes a teaching tool more than a learning tool. And we can integrate theory and practice. We can integrate um, knowledge into our personal life and action. And we can consider um, service learning experience in the bigger picture of culture and society, kind of the macro systems out there in the world. And we can also question our own knowledge and understanding through the reflection process. And you can't get that on a multiple choice test. So here's just a smattering of some of the theoretical models that we're going to use in the strategies presented today. John Dewey, you gotta love him. John Dewey and his learning experience. Kolb, the learning cycle. Um, Donald Schoen, the ladder of reflection. Yates and Jonas, levels of uh, transcendence and the three dimensions of reflection. All those theoretical models and principles will be um, the basis and foundations of what I'm gonna share with you here today. Here's the simplest way to think about it. If I had to pick one theoretical model, this is what I'd use. This is Kolb's learning cycle, where you do it, you do the service, you do the assignment, the project, and then you step back and go, what? What just happened? What were the results? And then you consider, hmm, so what? What do these results imply? How do I influence the outcome? And now what? What will I do differently next time? Or what should I do differently next time? What should we do the same? And then we try it again and see what happens. That's it for theory. But I wanted you to know that the strategies I'm gonna show you right now that we're gonna start doing are theoretically based. It's not just warm, fuzzy stuff pulled out of the ether. Reflection, eh? Oh, you mean journaling, right? Well, our good friend Rita, back on the Appalachian Trail, her understanding and concept of reflection was journaling. Not everybody likes to journal, to write in journals. And journaling may not be the best way to reflect on an experience. It's one way, it's not the only way. So what we're gonna be doing today is looking at uh, a lot of ways to conduct reflection. There's no single way. It is not just journaling. And you can actually mix and match the objectives and formats to accommodate different learning styles. So the objectives of reflection is to promote academic and cognitive growth. We're teachers. That's what we do. That's who we are. It's in our DNA. It's also a way to get the students to apply their skills that we're trying to teach them and, and want them to learn. It's also a way to get them critically thinking and how to articulate a position through civil discourse. My goodness gracious, in these times, we need to teach kids, adults, everybody, how to engage in civil discourse and conversation. It's also a way to develop personally and promote citizenship and to integrate theory and practice. All right. Here's a couple of things I'd like you to do for about 30 seconds. In your mind, you already have some pre-assumptions, pre-notions 
of what reflection looks like and the formats and methods. Take 30 seconds, no more than that, and just do a quick brain dump of what reflection looks like or the methods. Are you ready? Go. You've got 30 seconds. Fifteen seconds. Five seconds. Okay, put your pencil pen down. What'd you come up with? I bet you came up with some of these. There's oral reflection where we have discussions. There's written reflection like journals. It could even be in the arts or using multimedia. There's large group and small group. There's simulation activities. <clears throat> you can reflect as individuals and you can even reflect out of class at home in homework or in the community with a community partner. I bet you came up with some of those. Well, here's another little think about. Take another 30 seconds for a very quick brain dump, listing the pros and cons of reflection. I'm not trying to sell you a used car here. There are pros and cons to this. So another 30 seconds, pros and cons to doing reflection. Hit it, go. Okay, about 15 seconds. Five seconds. Okay, put that pen and pencil down. What did you come up with? I'm betting you came up with some of these things. Well, in large groups, you've got certain talkers who are gonna dominate. You've got shy students who don't contribute at all. Reflection takes up time from other activities. That's a big one. I hear that all the time. Well, I'd like to do reflection, but we've got to get through the curriculum. Okay. Um, it's lots to assess, evaluate, and grade. An advantage of large group, it's very efficient. Everyone's hearing the same thing, and it allows for different perspectives and ideas. Small group discussions you get to address some of the issues of larger groups. And you can reconvene a larger group to get reports from smaller groups. But time is also a factor. It's always gonna be a factor. With written formats, students can contemplate their ideas. They can take their time and ponder. Um, but that can also diminish spontaneity but it could be long or short. It could be a quick blast of 60 seconds like we've been doing right here now. They could be quick responses on an index card that can then be circulated. Longer reflection, maybe as a homework assignment, provides a deeper response and kind of a confidential response the, between the student and you. Another thing about written uh, reflection is it can be a dialogue between you and your student. I have had deep, profound interactions and exchanges with my students in a written journal. But large classes require more time if you're going to do that. But keep in mind, written reflection can take place out of class as well as in class. You can also start to have threaded discussions where you're building on written responses but you need to set some guidelines and rules when you do that, okay? And we'll talk about that a little bit. Some other challenges, we've already, already addressed some of these. Sometimes you get a lack of depth and richness. You get those dear diary entries, okay? Sometimes you get the venting or warbling or radio talk show kind of things and or Oprah book clubs where it's just a lot of flowery language that really means nothing and there's no critical thinking involved. So it's important to, to find methods that match students' individual learning styles. And that's hard to do when you've got a classroom full of different learning styles. 
And lastly, sometimes it's hard to assess reflection and determine if there's been any growth in the process of the kids' service learning experience. But stay tuned, I'm gonna show you how you can do that. So we've been together here for almost a half an hour. That's kind of the intro. Let's get down and dirty here and start talking about specific methods of reflection. Keep in mind, there is no right or best method. You don't even have to use these if you don't want to, but every time I've done this workshop, somebody tells me that they use this, they use at least one, okay? That's because these techniques are tried and true and easy to use. They can be combined, they can be modified. Keep in mind, some work better in some situations and demographics than others. And reflection can be a teaching and a learning tool, and it's not just for service learning. I've been a college professor for 30 years. I use reflection in all my classes, not just service learning. So here's what we're gonna look at today. We're gonna look at reflection. You've already done that. We're gonna look at graffiti, head, heart, and hands, what, so what, now what, and take a stand. And so in about, 55 minutes, you should have a pretty good handle of what all these things are. The other thing is a quick and easy way to assess and actually quantify your assessment process through a technique called Bradley's Gradient Assessment Method. And it's basically involving three, count them, three whole points. Level one or one point means the student's response was very cursory. It, it, it lacked elaboration. It didn't talk about why or how, it just kind of scratched the surface. A level two um, type of response earns two points. And that's a little deeper observation, but it's still limited. They left some things out. Maybe they didn't apply it or the context wasn't right. Whereas level three gets three points where the student is demonstrating complex understanding and application and they've articulated what they've done and learned really well. So they get three points for rich in-depth response, two points for a marginal response, one point for cursory response and zero for no discussion or they just gave you a bunch of words that had nothing to do with the assignment. And gosh, does that ever happen with your students? Okay. So why do we have the three, two, one method, method for assessment? I found the, out the hard way when I started doing service learning that if you don't have some kind of points you're gonna get dear diary entries or very cursory. The minute you start assigning some points, they're suddenly motivated to give you a little bit more than dear diary, okay? And it also helps you assess their growth. Keep in mind, some students freak out for getting a grade for getting a grade for a reflection. And that's because they think reflection is this touchy feely warbling thing. And how can you possibly grade what I'm thinking and feeling? Well, it is possible and we will show you how and why. Lastly, there is always a degree of subjectivity to assessment. You can't get around that, but we can get some common understanding. And when I've done these workshops with a room full of teachers, we get pretty good consensus on our, on our scoring and interpretations. All right, one last caveat. The scoring procedures I'm presenting here focus on content, not spelling, not grammar, not syntax. And I know that I've got reamed by a few teachers that said, well, what about spelling and grammar and all that? That's a different thing. You can do that in different assignments. In terms of uh, intentional consideration of an experience in light of, a, uh, of an experience or a service experience, we're gonna focus on this, all right? So just wanna make sure we've got that. Okay, the first one is preflection, and we've done this already. It's powerful, it's simple, it's grounded in constructivist learning theory. Can you say Vygotsky? It activates the learner's existing knowledge and experience. 
And here's what's really important. If they don't have existing knowledge and experience, you learn that right away. That's baseline information for you, the teacher. We use pre-flexion at the beginning of something. And there's different ways we can do this. Students can write down what they think they're going to learn. They can do it in a journal, a written paper. They could also write down what they want to learn. They can write down what they're excited or anxious about. Let me give you a couple of examples to illustrate this. I took 21 college students to post-Katrina New Orleans 15 months after uh, uh, Hurricane Katrina. We're sitting on the basement floor of a church. We're going to be there a week gutting houses. And on a scrap piece of paper, they all wrote down, what's one thing you're really excited about? They all wrote down. We threw it in the floor, in the center of the floor, and we drew them randomly and read them all aloud so we could see what we we're all excited about in an anonymous way. On another piece of paper, I wrote down, what are you nervous or anxious or scared about? Right, right, right. Throw it in the pile in the middle of the circle. Everybody randomly draws one. Okay, this was amazing to me. There were about three students who were afraid to work with power tools. This never crossed my mind. So I said, if you're one of those people who are afraid of working with power tools, let me know. We'll either make sure you don't use them or we'll show you how and teach you. And that was really fun to show folks. Wait till my dad sees, he never lets me use his power tools. Another thing that came up was people were afraid of spiders and snakes. I never thought about this either. And guess what? That was a real challenge, okay, because we did run into spiders and snakes uh, cleaning out houses in New Orleans after a hurricane. So that was good information for me to go in to know where my students were emotionally. Had nothing to do academically at that point, but we did do some pre-flexion with some terms like storm surge and levee system or the levee commission. We had academic terms as well. Another thing I do with my student lead, uh, all my students, not just student leaders, but the first day of class, they write a letter to themselves, telling them themselves what they're looking forward to, what they're afraid of. And at the end of the class or the experience, I hand it back to them and let them reflect on what they were thinking 10, 12 weeks earlier. So I remember one of my uh, service learning classes at a college level, where students were working with individuals with disabilities. They read their letters back and said, wow, I can't believe I was so nervous to work with someone with cerebral palsy. I learned that Bobby was more like me than not like me. And they saw how they had grown in 12 weeks by reflecting or reviewing on what the letter um, they had written to themselves. So collect, keep, and redistribute and reflect on these. All right, and you can assess that. We'll show you how to do that later. You can also tie in academic focus and objectives to this. This is when you write down a thought or a definition of a key concept. We did this about 40 minutes ago when I asked you to write a definition of reflection, okay? And then you can circulate the definitions around the room. You could pair up students and they share definitions and we share what we've learned and what happens in that experience is we all get a sense of how close we are in our understanding of the topic of the concept and we also find that hmm, somebody said something over here I never thought about or somebody said something over here I don't know I agree with all right and that leads to a really rich and robust conversation. And it's also good um, baseline information for the instructor. Because in class, we discover new perspectives and similar understandings. We're collecting baseline data. And then we can revisit their understanding and knowledge later on and even assessment, perhaps even using the three, two, one scoring procedure. Another option, 
It's simple. It's dichotomous scoring. You give a one if they were accurate in their um, in their post flexion concept, or a zero. And we can calculate percentage rates here. So let's try it. You wrote a definition of reflection a few minutes ago. And as your instructor, there were three key components, well, two key components to it. One was the intentional consideration and having learning objectives. And I'm also curious of just how elaborate you were in articulating that. So if you got at least intentional consideration and learning objectives, and you turn that into me, I'd give you two points. And if you went on and told me a little bit more about making meaning and, and uh, getting different perspectives, I, you know, probably a three. So that's one way to use three, two, one with a pre-flexion assignment, all right? Now, here's another example of collecting data through pre-flexion. And this was with an art professor at St. Mary's College. And as she met with me, she goes, Marshall, I'm an artist. I don't know anything about quantitative pre-post tests. But she had three basic key objectives and asked three basic easy questions before and after the class. What are key terms and steps of quilting what are the cultural, historic, ethnic roles of quilting? And have you ever, ever made a quilt um, before? We assigned one point to three uh, to each question. So there's three points possible. You got a one or a zero. Then after the class, she asked those three same questions again. And the students were able to say, yes, here's some key terms and steps for quilting. Yes, here's the cultural, historical, and ethnic roles of quilting. And yes, I've built, I've made a quilt. And so she was able to calculate 33%, 66%, or 100%. Later, she used um, a reflection technique called head, heart, and hands that we're going to talk about here real sh shortly. So I'm trying to show you that the pre post pre flexion, you can actually quantify and map out some development and growth, even in an art class. And that was a college professor. How are some uh, examples on the Iditarod Trail? You might ask your students, what are you excited or nervous about in preparing to hike the Iditarod? What is the Iditarod Trail all about and why is it important? How can the Iditarod Trail help us grow as persons or as citizens? You could give them a term like, or a, a part of history, like the serum run, or what is overflow? What is a roadhouse? What's the difference between the National Forestry Service and the Bureau of Land Management, right? Those are some examples in your context. I'm inviting you to start thinking about how you might use preflection in your class and in your service learning project on the Iditarod Trail. Our method number two, graffiti. It's a public response to a topic and it's effective with a two-sided issue, but it doesn't have to be a two-sided issue. You'll see what I mean in a minute. We place poster paper on walls or table and we have individual students or small groups of students rotate and respond in writing. Um, let me give you some two examples from my own experience to help kind of illustrate what I'm talking about. I had a doctoral student teaching a, a graduate level course on community engagement and service learning. And um, we we're talking about in the context of higher education. And around the room, he placed these weird shapes of paper, but on it, it said Sputnik era. Over here, he had, um, um, uh, um, land grant colleges. Over here, he had H, um, HBC, uh, historically black colleges over here. And people went and wrote what they knew on each of these topics. When that was over, after about five minutes, 
he brought up the pieces of paper and put them on the, the board up in front of class. And what they were were jigsaw puzzle pieces. And when it was all put together, he goes, now we have a picture of higher education in the United States over the past 200 years. And I thought that was so brilliant that he had the students generating these ideas of what they knew about these different dimensions of higher education. When I was at St. Mary's College, I was the new guy and we were trying to institutionalize service learning. So we put paper up around the room and over here it says, what is service learning? Over here it says, what is not service learning? Over here, what's best practice of service learning? Over here was what's not to do during service learning. And I turned loose about 35 college professors and they wrote it all down on these pieces of paper. We took all that information down, culled it, distilled it, and came up with our own operational definition and, and benchmarks for best practice that we use to institutionalize service learning at the college. And that was all done with poster paper and graffiti. Here's an example in an environmental studies class in a junior high school. The topic may be sustainability. And the graffiti responses might be, what are the advantages of solar power? What are the disadvantages of solar power? Compare and contrast advertising like billboards and the sponsorship of the Iditarod Trail. And a little trick or a variation on this might be, hey, write your responses from various perspectives. Let's say you're the executive of an oil company. Let's say you're the head of environmental advocacy group, or you're a tribal leader of an indigenous group, or you're a local business owner. Get inside their heads and respond to these questions on poster paper, how you think they might respond. In this way, we're stepping out of our own experience and into the experience of another. Here's some more examples. What does steward mean? By the way, that's a good one for preflection. How does how or what does this good student steward act or behavior look like? That's all on poster paper. How or what does a poor steward act or behave and look like? How does one learn how to be a good steward? How might you find examples of being stewards? How could our class be a steward of the Iditarod Trail? and you put paper up on the walls or on the table and turn your students loose for them to generate all these ideas. Here's some other factors to consider. It can be simply listing ideas or examples, maybe even feelings, without necessarily listing pros or cons, like, well, what is service learning and what isn't service learning? And later, you can have deeper development of the ideas in a journal response. Uh, and use other methods to use the three, two, one method. It can be responding to a thought or a quote or experience. What I love about the graffiti process is it provides a safe venue for shy students to be actively engaged in a reflection activity. This is a chance for that student who never says anything in a large group to be engaged and contribute to an activity in class. Here's some assessment ideas. How might you go about assessing graffiti responses, if at all? Or is this just a nice catalyst to stimulate active dialogue and discussion? You're gonna to have to think about that. How would you assess um, the um, graffiti responses your students do? Think about that. And I may have some ideas for you as we continue. Oops, here we go. So I'd like to invite you to just kind of pause because I've been talking at you for 50 minutes here and start considering how you might use graffiti. Jot down your ideas and come back to them later on. Chat this over with uh, your colleagues and, and other folks in, in the workshops. Listen to how they're using graffiti and then steal their ideas, okay? We teachers are really, we excel at stealing really good ideas from our friends and colleagues. All right, the next method, 
is head, heart, and hands. When I'm doing this technique with college students, I'm calling it the ABCs called affect, behavior, and cognition. But head, heart, and hands works great with K-12 situations. It can be done orally or in written reflection, in a journal, or even graffiti that we now know about. And it's a reflection framework. And it can also be used with assessment and to provide feedback to the students as to how well they understand a concept. All right, and let me show you how we do this. Head, this is what goes on up here, the learning. It's the cognitive connections to class content. Okay, I like alliteration. Cognitive connection to class content. It's an overt reference to a topic, term, or skill that you are learning in the classroom or in the community. Now, in the reflection process, it's not, oh, I learned a lot about myself, or I learned a lot. No, 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 no. We want to know, I learned a lot about mitosis. I learned a lot about the Berlin airlift. I learned a lot about uh, trail maintenance on the Iditarod. It's a specific reference to a, uh, of a topic, term, or skill. Heart is the attitudes, emotions, and feelings that they experience during the experience, plus why. So it's okay for them to say, I hated this, or I was scared, but why did you hate this? Why was it scary? Or I felt really good about this experience, and here's why. And hands is describing what they did, the behaviors. And I love this part because it works in nicely with the three, two, one, because we can invite students to share their behaviors or actions in the past, now based on this experience, and in the future. Well, in the past, when I dealt with this problem, I would have done this. But in our class, we learned how to do this. And in the future, I will continue to do this. And, and that's showing real integration of ideas into behavior. Here's a real life example, a fourth grade class in Salt Lake City, Utah. And they were collecting plastic grocery bags. All right, and they did head. What have you learned about plastic bags? Well, we learned that they are made from petroleum. We learned that they're hard to recycle. We learned that they cause pollution, okay? Heart, how do you feel about what we've learned or done in our, in our project, okay? And describe what you've done in the project. I need to back up. Here's the other thing that they did. They started collecting plastic bags and the teacher had one of those little metal doggy corrals that you put in your kitchen with puppies, you know, that's like three square feet. They put that in the corner of the classroom and they started bringing in plastic bags. Now she was tying science, environmental studies with math and they were measuring a volume and cubic measurements. And they were seeing how much landfill was being taken up by these plastic bags. And they learned that they were made from petroleum and that they cause litter and they hurt animals when the plastic bags, they're learning all this stuff, all right? So, uh, and then what was really cool is she asked the students, well, what should we do, okay? And that, that's gonna get into another technique we're gonna learn soon here of what, so what, now what? And ultimately, that fourth grade class said, well, if we used canvas bags, we wouldn't need plastic bags at a grocery store. This teacher and this classroom went to the PTA and that school started making canvas bags with the school logo on it. And the nearby grocery store started giving a five cent discount um, to people or, and made a five cent donation to the school if they came and used the bag. So the kids are learning basic math and science, volume measurement, they're using, in, they're learning environmental science stuff. They became good citizens and came up with a solution to a problem. But let me show you how this student or how this teacher did all this. She combined graffiti with head, heart, and hands. Let me show you what I got here. He put a poster paper 
And this is, this is the hands. I will cycle to save trees. I will recycle to save us. So this poster is hands. This poster is head. What we learned, it makes a lot of trash. It's made from petroleum. So this is what the kids learned. Oh, there's more. I'm so excited. Heart. I feel great because I recycle and keep my house clean. Uh, let's see. I save my oxygen and the world's oxygen. Uh, my world is cleaner when I recycle. I've got about 15 of these on the floor here in my room. So this teacher combined graffiti with head, heart, and hands. Each poster paper was one was head, one was heart, one was hands. Is that cool or what? Okay. Now we can explicitly teach the head, heart, and hands to students because they don't intuitively know how to reflect in these dimensions. So consider providing a sample. Now the downside of that is they think, well, it has to look exactly like that. So you're gonna, you're gonna have to deal with that. But the cognitive responses or the head will help determine um, the student's understanding of critical concepts. You can tell what they're getting and learning. And over time, we've discovered the head, heart, and hands as a teaching tool as well as a learning tool because you can see what they're saying in the head and they may be missing something. And you can go, you know what? We need to back up a couple of steps and go over this because your reflections are really good on this, this, and this, but you're forgetting one key thing. So let's go back and reflect on that and, and cover that. You can, here's another example closer to home. We've been doing campsite restoration along the Iditarod Trail. Head, what are some things you've learned from our project? Heart, how do you feel about what we've done or what you've learned or why? And hands, what things have you done in our project that you will continue to use or do in the future? Here's a person, another example of personal development, maybe with older students, because the Iditarod Trail could be a metaphor for life. Name a part of the trail or a political historical issue associated with the Iditarod Trail that reflects you and your personality. What are some of the emotions you encountered along the trail? And how do these reflections reflect emotions you encounter in life or school? And what are some specific attitudes or ways you approach to your work or hike on the Iditarod? And how can you carry this over into your life? Now, how do you assess head, heart, and hands? A couple of things to consider. First of all, there's no right or wrong answer when expressing the feelings of the heart. They're not penalized for negative feelings. We want to know, um, we want them to articulate what they're feeling and why. That's important to know because we as teachers and mentors can guide them and help them work through that. Some are uncomfortable with this because they think they're going to be penalized in some way and it makes them vulnerable. But I guarantee you, when students see that they can be honest with you and you support them and accompany them on that journey, like the college students in New Orleans who said, I'm afraid of this and that, they will be, you've earned their trust and respect and they'll be more open with you along the way. Second, in the head, students make must, must make overt references to content from the class. They must say, yeah, plastic bags come from petroleum. Plastic bags fill um, landfills and so on and so on. So you could give three points to each of the head, heart, and hands for a total of nine points. And depending on the scale that we talked about earlier, that three is really good, comprehensive, complete, accurate information uh, in their feelings, and then two is marginal. They've covered some things, but not everything. And one is very cursory, kind of you know, scratching the service. You award the three points in each of the head, heart, and hands. And you can calculate a percentage that way. Now, let's see if this next slide. 
Yeah, another uh, technique is um, dichotomous scoring, where they just get one point for each. So it's three points possible. And they either did it or they didn't. Now, here's where the head, heart, and hands and the assessment process becomes a teaching tool. Your comments acknowledge their student comments and feelings. And if they said they did really good job on say two of the head, heart, and hands, here's an example that I'm making up off the top of my head. I learned the paper bags are made of, or I learned the plastic bags are made of petroleum and they fill the landfill and they can be um, dangerous to um, animals and pollute uh, just the environment. And um, that makes me really sad and frustrated. Um, and so I don't like plastic bags and, um, and, and so, so there, that's it. So I could respond to the student orally or in writing, say, thank you for sharing. You did a really nice job telling me what you know and what we've learned about plastic bags. And I appreciate how you shared your feelings with me about what you learned, but I noticed you didn't tell me what you're going to do, how you're going to be a citizen and um, alternatives to using plastic bags. So I want to give you a chance to do this again. And you have until tomorrow to revise your reflection and add to your lovely reflection of the head and heart, but you haven't told me your hands, what you're going to do. So turn that in tomorrow. And I look forward to seeing what it is you think you'd like to do. So I explained why they got six points instead of nine points. And I encourage them to respond. Now, I do this with college students on their very first reflection because they don't really know what they're doing. And it's a freebie. The first one's a freebie. I'm telling you what you did right. I'm telling you what you didn't do right or what was missing. And I'm giving you a chance to do it again. So now they're learning, but I'm also teaching them you did fine on this, but you need to work on that. So that's the beauty of um, the assessment process with the head, heart, and hands. So let's look at a couple of samples here uh, in your handout and on this slide and see how you might assess the head, heart, and hands. This is an actual uh, reflection from a college student that was uh, a class on cultural diversity, All right? Read along with me. I'll read this really quickly. We're, I'm mindful of our time here. So this was a sociology class, cultural um, um, differences. And, um, and I think the service learning project was tutoring with um, uh, uh, different groups, okay? All right, so we spent last week, and this was a college student, I think a freshman in college or a senior in high school. I'll give you a context. This, this is not a first grader, obviously. We spent last week reading and discussing cultural differences and behaviors. And I have to admit that I wasn't all that into it when we first started go, going over the stuff. And I even had a little trouble getting it. It didn't really make a lot of sense to me because I hadn't seen examples. Well, this week I was tutoring in the after school program. And I worked with this little boy from the Navajo reservation. <clears throat> And I really saw this in action. I have a much better handle on all this stuff. Okay, it's kind of warbling so far, but we did get some feelings. He didn't make any eye contact with me. He kept his eyes down. At first I thought he was just, um, I can't see it, uh, or scared, shy or scared, maybe a little of both. But then I realized he might've been showing respect. This was one of the things we read about, eye contact, cha-ching. Okay, that's a cultural behavior that we talked about in class. Then, when I asked him a question to check his reading comprehension, I expected a pretty basic yes and no answer. Instead, he kind of went around and around with a lot of talking. And first, I thought he was just stalling or faking it. Then I remembered our class discussion about storytelling in some cultures how setting up history, characters, time, location, and all that are important. 
we white Americans tend to just cut to the chase with abrupt responses. So now I have a better sense of at least two cultural communication differences based on my service project. This really helped me because I responded to him differently. There's the hands, the behavior, the action. Had I not known about this stuff, I might have treated him differently or thought he was just weird. I know there are a lot of Native Americans around here. There was a reservation nearby. This was in Southern Utah. And I see them a lot. Now I'll act or treat them better the next time I see or talk to them in my dad's shop. Okay, we've got feelings. We've got cognitive connections to class, what he's learned. He learned about eye contact and storytelling culture. And he's talked about hands, application, what he's going to do and how he's going to use this in the future. I would give this a three for head, three for heart, and three for hands, a nine, a nine or an eight. <clears throat> so you can see how rich this paragraph is using the head, heart, and hands as a rubric, if you will, for reflection. Here's another one. This is an actual one, okay? I really like this project. It was a lot of fun. It felt good knowing, it felt good knowing I helped these old people. They are not as creepy as I used to think. My grandparents are dead, so I don't know about old people. Well, we don't know what the project was. We don't know what they did and why the student felt good about it. And we don't know what was being discussed about aging, okay? And so we would need to go back and tell them, all right, let's try this again. How did this apply to what we talked about in class? I'm glad you felt good about what you did. Why did you feel good about this? How were you helping them? And what would you, how would you have behaved in the past? How did you behave now? And how do you think you'll behave in the future? Try this again, all right? And so in that respect, they probably got three points out of this with an invitation, invitation to try it again. So, now it's time for you to start thinking about how you might use the head, heart, and hands in oral discussions or written reflection entries. What, so what, now what? I'm watching our time. We'll see how far we get, all right? But this came from the Campus Outreach Opportunity League, and I love this. It's so straightforward, and it really goes back to that Kolb model of learning, that cycle that we showed early on. And it's basically what, so what, now what, what? What is the topic or issue that's identified, defined, or discussed? What are we talking, is it mitosis? Is it the Berlin airlift? Is it, you know, um, sustainability? So what, what is the rational, rationale or importance of the topic and issue? And now what? What are the next steps? What are we going to do now that we know about this thing or concept and its importance? Here's an example, sustainability. Well, what is it? It's a term that's discussed in class. We had our reading assignments and we've asked students to reflect on examples in their lives and service learning experience. And all of a sudden they discovered, you know what? I don't do a whole lot of sustainability and uh, lifestyle. So what? What are the implications of doing or not doing sustainable practice? Does this matter? Why or why not? Let's get into small groups and brainstorm, and then we'll reconvene for a large group discussion of ways that we can be more sustainable in our lives. Now what are we going to do? Let's have a small group discussion on new policies or practice. Let's challenge some of our cultural norms and assumptions about sustainability. Let's come up with strategies to promote sustainability and then apply it to our service learning experience. All right, we can combine what, so what, now what with other um, reflection techniques, such as journal entries, head, heart, and hands. We can pair students up and go through all three steps. I love what, so what, now what, because it can be used with graffiti, small group, large group, Journal entries. Let's see some examples here. On the Iditarod, it might be the serum run. What was or is the serum run? 
And so what? Why are we learning this? What was its important? And what can we learn from it? Now, what do we need to take from that and do something? Another example might be today's dog sled race, advertising along the uh, Iditarod Trail. What are some indigenous customs and beliefs regarding the natural world along the trail? And some personal growth. What have you uh, done to grow? Why does that matter? And now what will you do with that? Okay. Assessment ideas, the most basic would be a dichotomous scoring of zero and one for each of the what's. All right. Or you can use that Bradley's gradient scoring for each of the what's, giving three points for a complex, complete, innovative response, two for adequate presentation of ideas and information, one for marginal presentation, and zero for a no response at all. All right, some more thoughts, and then I'm gonna give you an example. <clears throat> Many students, will provide the what information in a very straightforward and not necessarily very rich manner because they're simply surfing the web for factoids and getting the right answer. They're so focused on what and what is the right answer. So that's why exploring and articulating the so what requires critical thinking to support an idea or position you might even weigh this more, the so what than the what. And then keep in mind, you may not agree with their response, but is it viable or correct? And in a minute, I'm gonna show you an example where this actually happened in another workshop. So stay tuned. Here's some more examples about advertising or billboard signs posted along the Iditarod um, National Historic Trail. What are the pros and cons? What could or would advertising or billboards and sponsorship look like? What does this mean for the experience overall and the natural aesthetics as well as infrastructure and policy? And now what are the next steps to making a policy decision? Who should be involved when and how? Here's some more examples. What are the plants or animals identified on the Iditarod Trail? And what impact on nearby uh, co uh, communities do they have? What if advertising was allowed on the Iditarod Trail? Answer is if you were a member on the local Better Business Bureau or a member of the Iditarod Historical Trail Alliance. So how might you use what, so what, now what? Would it work for you? Why or why not? Think about how you might assess or score it, okay? Jot those ideas down and share it with a colleague here. Now, let's look at some actual uh, samples and uh, talk about assessment and discuss. This is an actual junior high student's written journal response using what, so what, now what. And they were talking about sustainability and bottled water. And this is her actual written response. <clears throat> Bear with me, here we go. And this is what she wrote, junior high girl. Bottled water is super bad. We learned in class that the bottles are made from oil, which makes us even more dependent on oil. Also, people don't recycle plastic bottles, so they just go in the landfills or trash, or trash up the place. On top of that, they have to be shipped from one place um, from other places, which also uses fossil fuels, when all I need to do is walk over to the faucet, which doesn't take any transportation by vehicles. Uh, water is not better for you. In fact, the plastic may be bad for you and cause cancer. The last thing is cost. We pay much less for water from the tap than we do for bottled water. So why waste so much money on something we already pay for? Now I use an aluminum water bottle and just fill it up at the water fountain. I rag on my older sister who always buys bottled water at the SEV, the 7-Eleven convenience store. It makes me mad that a bunch of companies are making so much money on something we don't need. I get even madder at people who buy bottled water and I'm gonna tell all my friends and relatives to stop buying it. That's one thing I can do to help the environment and that makes me feel good. 
I know I'm making a difference and showing up my sister. I think we should make bottled water illegal. I'm going to write a letter to my school newspaper about this. If you look at this objectively, she has addressed the what. What does she know about bottled water? And she cited facts about oil, about cancer, about um, cost, okay? And so what, why does that matter? And now what? She says, I'm gonna use an aluminum water bottle. I'm gonna write um, a letter to my school newspaper, okay? I'm gonna rag on people who do this. And if you use the, so when I did this workshop, this was back in West Virginia with the teachers on the Appalachian Trail. We collectively scored this using three, two, one th uh, for each what, so what, now what. And the consensus of the room for the most part was this was a pretty rich written reflection response. And most of the participants in that room, these teachers gave this student eight or nine points, except for one gentleman in the back of the room, who raised his hand and said, well, I'd give her zero. And this hush fell across the room. And so I invited the gentleman to explain, well, why would you give him, why would you give the student a zero? And he said, because I don't like her politics. This became a reflection moment for all of the teachers in the room where we reflected on to what extent our personal values, political, religious, social, influence our teaching. And when I invited the instructor to stop and think about what the objectives were and the rubric of the reflection of what, so what, now what, did she in fact do the assignment of what, so what, now what? And he acquiesced and said, well, yeah. And so he had a change of heart and said, well, I guess she does deserve those points. That was an interesting experience for all of us, but it helps us step back and think about our objectivity and what lens we're looking at the world and our students with. And that's why rubrics like the head, heart, and hands, what, so what, now what, are useful for us because it helps frame the objectives of the intentional consideration of an experience in light of learning objectives, and that separates it from our personal politics. Here's a second example. Today we worked on making rain trenches along the trail. All right, so now we know what happened, and there, we're talking about rain trenches. This help main, helps maintain trails so they don't get washed away. It was hard work, and I got blisters on my hands because I lost my gloves. We dug a trench so the water flows off the trails. Hmm. How would you score this using three, two, one for each of the what, so what, now what? It's not very rich. It's not very detailed. It, there's kind of a scratching of the surface, but do they really know what we're talking about and why it was important? So think about how you would score that. Well, last thing we're gonna talk about here real quick, because we're running out of time, is a technique called take a stand. And this is really great on a tired Friday afternoon. And we'll learn by doing it, okay? Um, so, since we're all looking at this on Zoom, instead of standing up, how about raise your hand, all right? I'm gonna ask you something, and if you agree with it, take a stand by raising your hand. Here we go. Students should be required to do service learning assignments. Raise your hand if you agree with this. Okay, let me tell you my experience of this exercise. I get a mix of people raising their hand and not raising their hand. That helps me sit back and then ask people, tell me why you raised your hand. Tell me why you're standing. And then I'll turn to somebody in the, in the I'll say, did you hear what they had, who was, wasn't standing up or raising their hand? Did you hear what they had to say? Respond to that. And then we start getting a dialogue going here. 
But what happens is when on this specific question, students should be required to do service learning, when the people say, when some respond, oh, you shouldn't re require students to volunteer. That's an important sign to me as an instructor that you don't understand what service learning is. Service learning is not volunteering. Remember, we talked about that. And so now this becomes a teaching tool and even an assessment device that I can see what your understanding is or is not. And we can, but instead of me saying that, I would turn to somebody in the room who's taking a counter position and invite them to respond. And so it becomes a Socratic dialogue of students in the room teaching each other, all right? So you can clear a physical space in the room and you prepare provocative questions and statements without right or wrong answers, pose the question, and students respond by standing up to take a stand. And then you have a dialogue on why they took a stand or why they remain sitting. And they're making a critical argument for their position. Here's the critical thinking and the civil discourse that's taking place. And the teacher becomes a facilitator as the students become the teachers and they're teaching each other. Some other factors for you to think about with this method is you can adapt or modify it with a Likert type response in the room, where on this side of the room is strongly agree and this side of the room is strongly disagree and you line up on a line and kind of gauge this. And as the dot, what's cool about this is as the dialogue ensues, you'll see students start to move and adjust their position. Keep in mind, students may not know how to respond because they haven't thought about the issue before. And after a discussion, allow students a chance to modify their stance. Consider listing the topic questions in advance so they can think about it and always include the why and responses. That way we avoid the warbling or the radio talk show debates. Now, how could you or how would you or could you assess take a stand? I mean, would you use a three, two, one system? I mean, you probably could, but I think it would be hard to do it. I would suggest you consider adding or enhancing the activity of take a stand by later having a reflection journal activity or using what, so what, now what, or the head, heart, and hands. Um, that could be graded and use the take a stand um, activity as a catalyst to get the, the mental wheels rolling here. So you can combine these methods, take a stand, so what, now what? So, so what, you're talking, you're doing that while taking a stand, like why is this important? And now what, you could do that during the dialogue, you could do it in the written journal responses or in small group discussions. Okay, Whew. that's a lot. We've been talking here for almost 90 minutes and let's put all this together. What is reflection? And so what? What difference does it make, if at all, if we know about or use reflection? And now what am I gonna do with it? And what I, did I learn today, if anything? Remember, reflection is like tending a garden, okay? We have to help our students make meaning of their experience and reflection is an internal making meaning process that we hope they can later externalize, not only on a paper or an exam, but in being a good citizen and making a difference in the world. So I hope you'll be able to use some of these ideas in your class and out in the community and invite your community partners to participate in any of these, uh, these methods. All right. So any thoughts or questions that we might have here as we wrap up here? Well, I wanna thank all of you for the work that you're, that you're doing, that you've done. Teachers are my heroes, especially now you're on the front lines. God bless you. You are the superstars. And doing service learning is even more on your plate. This is not easy stuff. This is hard stuff. 
And so, I mean, you just have my total respect and admiration. And I hope you can take at least one of these reflection ideas and use it in your with your students. So thanks for having me join you this year. Marshall, thank you so much. That was awesome. And I, I have to say that whenever we've used this in iCheck, people absolutely use the ideas. I One of my favorite examples was a preschool teacher who did head, heart, hands with a little foam rubber heart and a little foam rubber brain and a little foam rubber hand, and they'd sit in a circle and pass them around. So all really useful. I really appreciate you being here. Thanks so much. Um, Again, I just want to emphasize if for future sessions, you can write to itrek Alaska, I T R E C Alaska at gmail.com, and we'll send you a flyer. We've got some great stuff coming up. On February 17th, we'll do the last of the three part series on questing. And on March 1st, we'll learn about the iTrek Educator Resource Guide, which you can uh, download a copy of. We'll be looking at outdoor classrooms at Wolverine Park on March 24th and Sand Lake on April 5th. And the ever popular nature art is coming on March 31st. And Marshall, you're going to love to know that we're going to be um, bringing together Appalachian Trail teachers and Iditarod teachers in a teacher's lounge on April 26th. So uh, maybe you can even join us. That's fun. I'll have to see if Rita can come. Uh, just it's a fun chance to kind of talk about what, how we're everybody's dealing with the pandemic, how people are keeping place-based learning alive. So everybody, thank you so much for coming and we look forward uh, to seeing you in a future session. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.